Like people, businesses have their journey, their path, sometimes straight, but more often evolving, growing, and adapting to a changing world, creating the need for knowledge in areas like accounting, consulting, tax, technology, areas critical to your continued growth and success, all part of the journey, all part of what we do together with you. Because your success is the destination. MNP, wherever business takes you. We all need Canada's youth to succeed. We need youth to help design drones to put out forest fires and ensure artificial intelligence doesn't outsmart us all. We need youth to help cure the diseases we don't even know exist yet. We need new skills for a completely new job force. But we're not prepared. That's why RBC created Future Launch to empower Canadian youth for the jobs of tomorrow. Welcome to Python's Pit. Today we have Kiran Kumar from Crossbow Canada who has a clear mission to inspire Canadian youth. Imagine hundreds of thousands of high school students all across Canada and maybe even the US doing something they love for someone they don't even know. Now what if I told you within 10 or maybe even five years this could be a reality because I'm already working towards it. In fact, I'm the CEO and founder of a movement called Crossbow Miles Canada, which works to inspire Canadian youth to launch passion projects, which then work to make a monumental impact to the lives of women and girls in India. Now, despite my best efforts, that seems very complex. So let me break it down with you. I'll start with what I like to call the impact here, what we're doing in Canada. For the past 18 months, every Friday morning, I stroll into my morning meeting with the pure goal to inspire my students. I want them to see no boundaries, or when they see it, I want their first instinct to be to demolish it. I want them to challenge themselves. I want them to challenge me. But most importantly, I want them to identify that one thing, that one thing they're just so passionate about that they can't help but do something about it and it started to pay off. When a few months back, Rafia came up to me and said, you know what, Kiran? I've been doing some thinking, and I think we should set up a medical camp in Kashmir. Or when Lily Lee came up to me and said, Kiran, it's time we wrote a book. All I said to them was put together a team and keep me posted. Now, we have several successful passion projects, which all raise funds and awareness which go towards what I like to call the impact there, what we're doing in India. We spent numerous board meetings with adults, several morning meetings with students, and a lot of research towards identifying the one thing that stands in the way of a girl child getting educated in India. Much to our surprise, we identified that it was no toilets in high schools. No toilets in high schools. It costs less than $200 to build a toilet in a school. Canadian. No one in this room can tell me they can't lend a helping hand. Not even a high school student. But if we take a step back and we take a look at our impact here and impact there, you might identify that these two seemingly unrelated issues can work together to be solved in a sustainable and scalable manner. What we identified was that Canadian youth need a platform to apply their education, while women and girls in India need the resources to receive an education. We provide the platform for one, and they produce the resources for the other. Thus, an impact here, impact there. But Pythons, I warn you, I think big, and it's time we take Crossbow Canada to the skies. But I can only do that with your help. So what do you say? Is it time to let an impact here, impact there?
So we're joined here with the passionate volunteer executive director of Python Spit, Fareen Samji. Thanks for being here. We had a great day today. So tell us a little bit about why you started Python's Pit. As an entrepreneur, I wish I had mentorship, guidance, and an opportunity like Python's Pit when I was in high school. Sure. And uh, I think you know we uh, we all need a little bit of inspiration in our lives. And if we can catch these high school kids uh, when they're passionate and when they're just starting out on their journey, I think we can leave a lasting legacy for them. So for me, Python's Pit is that the, the perfect vehicle for them to learn not just entrepreneurial skills, but they get to be on TV, they get to be, they have cameras in their face and makeup and lights and all these other skills that they don't necessarily learn in school. Absolutely. Python's Pit is an extremely amazing opportunity that you, you did start on a grassroots level and it's grown into a, a, a great beast itself. So thank you very much for starting it and uh, like giving so many students an opportunity to take part. You know, it was one of those things where when the, when the idea came about and was conceived, it, it had to be done. And with the help of the Rotary Clubs in Halton Region, with the help of our sponsors uh, and all the volunteers involved, uh, we've, we've been able to create a really cool project that mm -hmm. is run by volunteers and professionals, yeah. and professional volunteers. And so yeah. I think the, 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 the students in Halton Region are super lucky mm -hmm. to be able to have an opportunity to be able to, to pitch in front of the Pythons, um, who are themselves really accomplished entrepreneurs. And it shows that we can't do this program alone, right? It's all about the community collaboration, right? Absolutely, and that's when we started. We went to all the communities in Halton, and we said, hey, this is what we want to do. Will you help us? And all the Rotary Clubs, and, and everyone coming together to, to help us. And uh, it's just been a really, really neat journey, and I can't wait. I I feel like we're on the brink of an explosion. I, hope I really so. do. We're on the brink of so. an explosion, and I can't wait. I can't wait to see what the future years hold. Fantastic. Well, thanks for chatting, Free. Thank you, David. Pythons, Kieran is leading the charge to inspire youth in Canada for these awesome projects. Michael, what do you think about the presentation? So, firstly, beautifully done. I, I really enjoyed the the discussion. I just have a question around the, the role that Crossbow is actually going to play and, and how you're going to link that impact, yeah, impact there. Definitely needed. I think it's a, a, a great uh, you know, value proposition. There's definitely something there. But I just want to understand, flesh out the product a little bit more for me. What, what is the role you're going to play and how are you going to link those two? So thank you very much for answer, asking that question. I'll answer it now. Um, so something that really used to bug me when I started off with this movement was how uncreative it was. So when I started off, there was no impact here, impact there. When I started off, it was purely to empower women and girls in India. And I started to ask myself, why are we doing this? Is this, are we missing one more nonprofit? Is that what we lack in this world? Or are we missing the way to do it in such a sustainable way that people want to contribute and don't feel like they're always giving all the time. That's where the impact here, impact there came in. And that's why I feel that the role Crossbow will fill will be the role of allowing people to do something good, but not entirely sacrifice what they've earned. Because when you say a woman or a girl has the right to an education, you're also saying that you're also taking away someone else's right to their money. You're also taking away someone else's right to their to what they've earned. So we want to do it in such a way that they get something in return as well. Even if they're a student volunteering their time, they should get something on their resume. They should get self-confidence and they should get experience. Thank you. Clinton, what do you think? Great energy, very inspiring. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I think a big part of any sort of initiative, not for profit, like it really requires a passionate leader. And I think that uh, you're going to be great in that role, and uh, that's really going to drive your success. I think obviously it's a, it's a hugely worthwhile cause, and, and uh, the way you're going about it's fantastic. So, I, uh, I guess my, my only question for for you would be, um, um, do you have any sort of mechanisms or plans in terms of fundraising? to help launch your program further beyond, you know, if you won the Python's Pit, for example, is there other ideas you've got in mind to generate more funds? Yes, so I'm a big believer yeah. in risk and return. Yeah. So although I know that's not linked to many uh, nonprofits and how they work, they mm -hmm. try to raise funds and send it straight away to the cause. I feel that doesn't have the potential I want for this movement. So when I look at doing something like Python Spit, when I look at applying to those 60 grants I applied to yesterday, when I look at, in general, asking people for donations, asking for sponsorship, 
I don't, I'm not going to straight away send that money to the cause. In fact, the first thing I do before I even know if, I'm, if my application is going to be read, before I even know if I'm going to get a call back, I ask my team, people who are leading, the leaders who are leading the passion projects, to make me a spreadsheet with a budget to tell me how much, how can they can maximize their revenue. And whether they think if I gave them $50, they'd be able to raise it by a larger amount in terms of percentage than if I were to give them 200. Because sometimes you invest more and you make more, but you don't make as much more as you could have made with a small budget. So the idea of optimizing and making sure you're giving the money to places that are actually producing the revenue is something that I've been discussing with lots of adults and working out with my team to in an organized manner and an efficient manner, find a way to raise the most funds. So Glenn, did you have any questions around the business model itself? I'm a kind of a nuts and bolts person when it comes to my business. So uh, I am a little perplexed on, uh, on your pitch. I love your passion. That is fantastic. And um, you have to have passion to be successful at anything you do. You have to believe it. And I can see it in you. I, 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 I know you have the passion for it. And, I, and I'm trying to figure out how you're turning that passion into dollars. And then how does that relate to regions uh, in India? What, what governments have you reached out to there? Are they willing to, um, to take your dollars and do what you want with them? Putting, um, you said, washrooms in schools. It sounds like uh, an easy thing and you would think any um, geographic area in India would be welcome to those types of things, but there are government hurdles everywhere. And India is, is one of those countries where you could start at the bottom and you have to work your way up to get anything done. How far have you gone in there? So I remember when I started to fundraise for building toilets, how confused I was of how I was going to do this. I knew usually you can rely on government. You can rely on their, their initiative to build toilets in schools since they're the ones who have been raising awareness about this issue. But there's lots of corruption. How do you get around that? Another issue is when you want to build a school, you give the school the money, but they won't build it because they'll send the funds somewhere else. Or in some areas, it's actually against the religion to put a toilet within that school. There are so many obstacles. So that's why I wanted to start with something that I knew we could fix. I wanted to be able to guarantee to people who are donating to us that things are getting done. And that's why I have, de I have decided to team up with an existing nonprofit in India who knows this issue, is familiar with what other issues are, they are, and we should learn from them. We should work with them, and we'll be giving our funds to them. And since we do have, I do have connections in India, thanks to my parents coming from there, I do know someone who knows the nonprofit very well, and they will be monitoring where the funds go. And of course, after a few years, when we have sent a substantial amount of funds towards that cause, we will be visiting to make sure and see what our work, what work has been done to make sure things are working in the direction we want it to. Right. Dr. Biss, any questions? Uh, so you're, um, you're competing in, a, in an interesting um, place because you're also competing with other organizations like um, Care India where they're looking at funds and you know collecting money and then donating it to these sort of projects. Um, and I guess I'm just trying to figure out because in today's marketplace, you have to be unique. You have to get attention. And I'm confused as to how you're going to do that. Like, how would you get attention from us if we were looking to you know, donate to a charitable organization? Why would we choose you? So one of the great things you said is competition. And I remember learning about that in business class. And I remember thinking, how could you set yourself apart? And in some areas, it can get really complicated because you don't know what market prioritizes what. And sometimes you can lose the identity of your movement in the meantime. But I don't feel like we're competing with other nonprofits anymore. I feel like we're competing with Disney because we're making a music video in one of our passion projects. I feel like we're competing with Rick Riordan because he writes books and we're also writing a book. 
I feel like we're competing with another scientist who is focused on building a medical camp while we're also focused on the same thing. I feel like since we have so many small passion projects, we're making everyone mad at us. Everyone wants to say, hey, why are you doing this? We've been here for so long. And that's why I like to think of no boundaries. That's why I tell my students, so what? Disney's not that big. Or do you know how they got big? They got big by not being confined by verticals. They got big by not letting themselves see, hey, that's, we're, we're making Mickey Mouse. Why would we open an amusement park? By not being constrained by things that other businesses are traditionally constrained by. So when I think of competition, I think of not just angering everyone. I think of going into so many different areas that we build a brand for ourselves, that people don't look at us and say, maybe this isn't the best music video. But the point isn't that. The point is this same girl who's heading this music video was also writing a paper for a medical camp two days ago, was also in India giving speeches about why you, your steps can raise funds. Maybe I'm thinking a little too big. Maybe things could have gone a little slower. But in my opinion, if you want to take on someone like Disney, you have to be a Pixar first. So I'll wor when we're Pixar, when we're big, when we're at that stage, I'll worry a little bit more about competing with Disney. They were very kind, they are very open, and I could see the passion in them um, already there. So it's always easier to pull passion out of people than to put it in them. So I loved uh, how nice they were, I loved how passionate they were, and they all seem to have gears moving in their heads with questions. So hopefully we can, I can follow up and answer more of it for them.